The B-Sides DC 2016 videos are brought to you by clearjobs.net and cybersecjobs.com, tools for your next career move, and Antietam Technologies, focusing on advanced cyber detection, analysis, and mitigation. All right, so for those of you who attended the talk prior to us with Sean, you got free puppies. Unfortunately, today with Breakpoint Labs, no free puppies to report. Um, so at least what I can give you is a thank you, and thank you very much for coming as well as everyone who put this event together. This is our first B-Sides uh, DC event we've ever done, so we're really glad to be here. So on behalf of Breakpoint Labs, I'm Zach Myers, this is Andrew McNichol, and today we're gonna to talk to you about how to go beyond automated testing. And when we say automated testing, we're talking about your big gun vulnerability scanners and things of that nature from an external assessment perspective. So let's jump into this. So here's an agenda, high level, overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm not going to bore you and go dot by dot, but essentially we're going to talk about the methodology and practice that we use in any external assessment. We also will kind of heavy in on the manual testing aspect and why it's really important. So when you run these automated vulnerability scanners, you don't just stop there and then hand the report to your customer or just re reduce false positives from the automated scanner. You actually do some manual testing. And we're going to go into some really good examples of how you do that and how you go above and beyond and give them that actual great report that they're looking for. So who am I? Like I said, I'm Zach. This is Andrew. You can find us on Twitter at the following Twitter handles, uh, Bear Munch Primal Sec. Essentially, we're security geeks by nature. Um, we're red teamers at Breakpoint Labs. Uh, there's our handle there for Breakpoint. Uh, we're bloggers and podcasters and contributors to the Primal Security uh, blog and podcast. So feel free to check that out. We just recently released a new uh, blog the other day on uh, SMB Relay with Nest and how that's a fun attack vector. Um, we're certification junkies in a way that we have a lot of different certifications from Offsec and SANS. We respect them all very, very much. Um, our go-to scripting language is mostly Python. Uh, we love capture the flag events. We love to mess with vulnerable VMs. So anything on VulnHub, we'll try and test it and try to figure it out, create our own little walkthroughs personally and co collaborate with our team members. Uh, we also love to constantly learn. So anyone who's in this industry, you understand we're always at an uphill battle. We're always learning and evolving and always trying to get bigger and better. So that's why we love this industry. I'm learning something new every day and I'm always getting something from other people, so I don't know everything, and I will never claim to know everything. Andrew's famous line is, what I don't know could fill books. Um, so we live by that motto, yeah. And um, we also like long walks on the beach, and if you do too, or by the pier, come join us at Knapsack. It's a recent group that me and another guy from Lars uh, started. Uh, essentially, we just meet up, it's a happy hour, meets once a month, usually the third Tuesday of every month. Um, in downtown Annapolis. It's just a network event. We talk about different things. Um, if, you know, you, if it was recent, um, you know, as anyone knows here, Dirty Cow just came out, so that kind of kept some people up, Linux admins at night and you know, the like. So we probably would have talked about something like that, but it's just a good way to get to know people and network and just have a beer or two. So overview. So we want to share our experiences with external security assessments. Essentially, the motivation behind this talk um, was pretty much frustration, to be honest with you. Um, the higher powers at B always asking us, when is the scan done? Have you completed the scan? How often is the scan occurring? You know, we hear this all the time as people working in InfoSec where everyone just thinks everything's a scan, but it's not. There's much more to it, and, and we're going to kind of cover that. Whether you're a red teamer or a blue teamer, I hope that you walk away with something from this talk. Automated testing, when I say automated testing throughout this thing, and Andrew does too, think of running a vulnerability scanner, because you kind of add a definition whatever term you want to call it. Uh, manual testing is everything else that you're going to do beyond the scope and going beyond that, that automated vulnerability scanner. And we're going to pick up on that definitely throughout. But I always think it's a cool little note. Department of Home, Homeland Security uh, reported that 67% of high impact vulnerabilities actually were found through manual testing and not signatures and vulnerability scanners. So I like to land that point, especially with customers. So how do you go beyond a scan? Well, first of all, you have to have the right mindset, and that's basically you're going to fail a lot more times than you're ever going to succeed as a pen tester. Um, you need to perform recon and mapping. You need to find your footprint. You need to know what you're up against, and you need to find out all the content that's available to you on the internet. You need to run these automated testing. We are not going to bash automated vulnerability scanners. Every single person in this industry runs them, and we run them too. But you need to run the right tool for the right job. And then you need to really 
go in and go in depth with your manual testing. And this is where we really want to understand and identify and fuzz all areas of user input that are being passed to the applications and the like on the internet. We want to research the technologies and the versioning associated with these technologies. Sometimes it's just a simple, you know, Joomla version exploit DB. And you find out a lot more things and a lot more vulnerabilities than you ever would if you just didn't do that. And we need to combine findings. A lot of times with our vulnerability scanners, and we'll get into this with a good example later, they'll report several low findings. But if you kind of piece them together, you can create the perfect storm into a critical, really big, bad finding that an automated vulnerability scanner wouldn't find, but you could do with manual testing. We also need to remove the false positives and abuse all the features that we find with these things on the internet. And then we need to take all this fun stuff we just did and put it into a report. It's our favorite part as being a pen tester in any assessment. We always love to convey everything we found because but that's what everyone pays for. You know, it's the final report essentially. Uh, but we need to make sure that we convey it to the business impact as well and know what keeps up these firms at night. So with every method to a madness, you, you, know, you need to have a methodology. Uh, and a solid methodology is not only good from a business perspective, but from that technical perspective as well. And you don't need to marry the methodology. And what I mean by that is you don't need to go in sequential order. When you do these security assessments, a lot of times you'll find something maybe in your manual testing, and then you go back to recon. So you don't need to like just always do recon, then automated testing, then manual testing. You can jump back and forth between these things, and especially if you're collaborating with a team, you'll always learn new things. So it's really important that you do that. Uh, there's several great methodologies out there that exist. These are just three examples. Some checklists, some guidelines, things of that nature. Feel free to check those out. And we believe, honestly, that every methodology should not only include the automated testing, but the manual testing as well, especially when you label it you know, as a secure, an in-depth security assessment or a pen test. So here's our methodology from a high level. It's probably just like every other generic methodology, but you know, we go, we're going to cover these steps, planning and scoping, reconnaissance mapping, automated testing, manual testing, reporting, and then the icing on the cake, the remediation support. But before we jump into the planning, I would like to just say, I think today in our industry, we've become a hybrid of not only not only having the hard skills, but we have to have the soft skills because we have to convey our findings and our security assessments, not only at a detailed level, but a high level that the high level will understand, the developer will understand. So I really just want to say, I think that soft skills are very important in this industry. So definitely hone in on those and make sure that you convey them. And just know that every time you go into an assessment, you have to have that mindset that you're going to fail a lot more and you're going to succeed. And it's like hitting your head against a brick wall half the time. So planning. This is where we want to know what our customers' goals are, right? So we want to establish the scope, which is the what. We want to establish the rules of engagement, which is the how. We want to set up communication channels. And we want to set up the appropriate time frame, being the who and the when. If you don't set up communication channels properly, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, it's just going to be a whole nightmare with emails going back and forth and confusion of who to speak to. Um, you don't want to get caught up in the terms. We've seen this a lot with our industry is sometimes people will define things as a pen test or an in-depth vulnerability assessment, and it completely means something. It's, it's in the eye of the beholder. So you really need to define that and understand that in the planning phase because sometimes a pen test means exploit the systems if you find the vulnerability, and sometimes it means just uh, stop when you find the vulnerability. Don't exploit it. So you really need to define that so you don't go you know, and make somebody pissed off or go beyond the scope. And you also want to figure out what's the most important thing. What keeps them up at night? Is it the confidentiality, the availability, or the integrity of the data? If they say it's all the things, then you know, I guess I'll just kind of go about that with grading the impact. But if they say, oh, man, if I lose availability and I can't make sales, if we find something that deals with denial of service, we'll probably rate that as a more higher vulnerability in the report. Before we jump into recon, I always like to convey this, and I think it's a really cool idea. A lot of times we'll just type things in Excel spreadsheets, Word docs. Try and create a mind map next time. When you're collaborating with a team or you're just working on things, it's a great visual free tool that basically you can say, here's my target organization. Here's the things I'm finding on the internet of their systems or the vulnerabilities, however you want to rank it. And just go from there and kind of spiders out. You can get a nice visual representation. And uh, I always like to land that point because I'm a visual kind of person. So reconnaissance. This is where we get to play detective, and it's fun. Um, essentially reconnaissance. The goal is, I give you a company's name. Go, find all the bad. No, OK, no. A lot of times, they usually say, besides the company name, 
they'll give you usually a whitelist or they'll maybe give you a cedar range and say, this is our IP space, you know, and you go from there and you essentially want to footprint everything and try to find all their things that belong to them. You want to do IP and domain research with those utilities, with search engines. You want to do system enumeration, whether it's passive or active. You want to do subdomain enumeration, and you can do that through search engines. You can do it through certificate searches. You know, Fierce is a great tool as well. Um, you want to do that tech stack enumeration with applications. There's tons of technologies that are always in use and collaborating together. You want to try and see if you can get the versioning information as well, and those are some good things you can use right there. And you want to do your open source intelligence gathering, and that's when you really are playing detective. You're trying to see the target organization you're doing the assessment for, if they've acquired other companies recently that they maybe forgot to address in the planning. You know, you're trying to figure out their email name scheme, their domain scheme. They're trying to figure out all the way that maybe that they do first initial last name for their logins, all the like. So you're trying to really play OSINT. So system enumeration. How many of you have heard of Shodan or Census? Raise your hand. Okay, good. That's actually a lot better than I thought it would be. Well, okay, so it's not going to, not many people here, I'm going to change your life. Um, but Shodan and Census are basically passive third parties that do these port scans and these service enumeration for you and really give you that great database of information when you're going up against a domain or an organization or IP space, and you can just query it and look it up. Census is free. Shodan has free, but it also has a paid for if you really want to leverage it for heavy searches in its API. Um, if you go to do active scanning, we all pretty much use Nmap here, I imagine, which is a great port scanner, service enumeration tool. Um, you can use it for many other different things. It also has its scripting language, um, great tool. But let's say, for example, you're in a jam and you're running, a slash 16, you're running against a slash 16 Cedar range. Nmap may take several hours to get you back data. Well, try mass scan in your next assessment. It may take you only a minute and get you results that are pretty comparable. Um, and the thing that's nice about that is when you are in a jam and you're going against a big range, it'll pull that information for you, and there's not too much of a variance in the results. Another thing here, we created just a simple uh, Shodan searcher where essentially we gave it the domain, the top level domain, and it pulled out the Cedar ranges here. So this is like just a way you can use Python to do it quick and dirty with the Shodan API, pull information, and do this system enumeration. So subdomain enumeration. You can use Google, you can use Shodan, use the search engines to try and find subdomains off the main domain of the organization. You can use CRT.sh and look at certificates, you know, for different various applications. You can use ReconNG as a framework. It's great at doing all types of things, and Jason Haddix actually wrote a script called enumall.sh for ReconNG, so feel free to use that in your next assessment. And you can use Fierce. It's a golden tool that basically does, you know, DNA, it tries to do DNS zone transfer, it tries to do brute forcing and enumerate subdomains, so it's a really good golden tool to use. Tech stack enumeration, this is really important as well. And we're going against applications, there's various ways we can go about this. If we want to just go across a list or just do a simple request, we could use a tool like WhatWeb, it's a command line tool. You're basically going to, uh, you know, use WhatWeb to do a banner grab of the site and it's going to basically tell you the technology and versioning if it can, right in the command line. Wappalizer is really cool. If you use Chrome or Firefox as your main browsers, install, uh, install Wappalizer. It's just a plugin. As soon as you type something into the URL run line, on the far right will be a, you can click a button and it essentially give you a drop down list of all the technologies that are powering the site you're visiting right now in your browser and any versioning information if it can pull it. Eyewitness is a great thing too. When you're going against a big organization or a list of IPs or a list of domains, you can basically <clears throat> create this report where it's going to try and get that service technology information from doing a banner grab and then show you a screenshot of the landing page it gets. So you can kind of go, okay, well, you know what, this is their OWA server here and that's their main site here and it's a SharePoint site and it has a login I see. Okay, I'm going to go after these two things out of these 30 things when I just see default IIS pages. So you kind of get an idea of what should be your, your key priorities to target at first. And then OSINT. This is where a lot of times, I mean, not a lot of times, a few times, we've seen it where we'll get an organization, right? And when we do a little bit of searching and digging, we find that there's stuff posted out on the internet, creds, you know, different things, they've been popped, and they have no idea. 
They just have absolutely no idea. And no one has ever told them, and it's a scary thing. So you always need to do your detective work there. Um, you want to try and figure out the username scheme and the handles of different users and developers that work for these organizations. And then you get really kind of creepy, and you look them up on YouTube and social media platforms. But really, what you're doing is you're doing your due diligence as an attacker. And you're looking at, you know, if they use this handle, you know, Happy Panda, and they use it across YouTube and all their social medias and, and you know, their Stack Overflow and their GitHub and their Pastebin, you can start to look and see if they actually post any code from the organization that probably shouldn't be out there. Or are they asking troubleshooting questions that they should not be and goes against your policy for your organization? And also, can you find source code online? So if we go against open source technologies, we like to pull down those different things and try to basically make a lab environment and see where can we find different holes and different things in that server-side code if it's actually available to you online and not commercial if we don't have it. All right, and then Andrew's going to jump into mapping now. Hey, guys. So uh, carrying on from what Zach talked about with reconnaissance, um, we've built our list of systems, right? So we start out with that company name and whoever it might be, uh, and we've got a list of systems. And you go to a lot of the pages, you see default IIS stuff because you're going by IP, not by domain. And the next step is to figure out what's actually all there because um, there can be a lot. So because we're talking about external assessments, we do a lot of, it's a lot of web application stuff. So mapping is kind of specific to that, but you can look at it as just learning more about the technology and defining what's there regardless of the service or protocol. Um, but with regards to web applications, it's kind of broken down into two main ways. You have spidering, which is you know, crawling the links in the site, all those hrefs, what it wants you to see. And you have unlinked content, which is a land of uh, treasure uh, up for us as pen testers. And that relies on brute force techniques, you know, requesting the resource to see if it's there and, and looking at the status code or the response length and, and, and checking it out. Um, the other important thing to do is we, I just see a lot of like junior pen testers do this a lot. Uh, you know, don't judge a uh, system by its IP. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, you, you can put your IP in the browser, shows you back very little. You might need to actually know where the, the content's living, that unlinked directory, or you may need to reference it by the domain name for like virtual hosting. So it's just important things to keep about when we switch from the port scanning option, which is more IP based to the application mapping, which is more a lot of times domain based. Um, this is just a quick look at spidering. Um, Burp's our bread and butter tool for a lot of the stuff we do with external assessments. Pretty easy to do. Uh, right click spider. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. Sitemap's pretty nice. We will, however, talk about some of Burp's additional features, uh, which go into like the pro version. Uh, but Burp's pretty cheap. So if you're a pen tester, you should probably have Burp's pro version anyway. Uh, Intruder's really nice. Uh, Intruder can be used for fuzzing, we'll talk about later, but also for unlinked content enumeration, because all it does is basically rapid fire requests for you based on what you set up. Um, we, I use Sniper a lot just because it's uh, uh, really good for the unlinked content enumeration. Burp also has a discover content feature which tries to dynamically uh, find this content. Um, you also want to make sure you check out web services, the, the question mark whistle. There's other tools out there, SOAP UI, that, for that specifically. Um, with all these techniques though, you rely on the brute force method I mentioned. And it's high, heavily dependent upon your word list. I really like the robots disallowed, which is the top entries uh, for, uh, from Alexa 100, 100K sites. And then there's also Seclist, which has a bunch of good stuff, including Raftlist, which is like an older project that did the top Alexa 1000 robots at text. But there's a lot of good word lists in there. And I, I, if you run these things against your applications um, in your enterprise, even if you're um, a security guy doing volume scans, you will find cool stuff. I found resumes with hundreds of thousands of social security numbers just because it was unlinked, hanging off a web directory that nobody knew about. So, you know, little things like that, unlinked content can be a gold mine. Now for automated testing. We're not going to spend a lot of time here with this. We're going to assume you can do the scan button, click the scan button. What I will say is that it's important to run that right tool for the job. I think Zach mentioned that earlier. That's really key because what I see a lot of times is people will rely on one or two sets of tools to do their big guns vulnerability scans. When I say that is I have organizations that just use Nessus. Nessus is a great tool for network vulnerability scanning, but it doesn't address web apps very well at all. Um, or they'll just use WebInspect and they just, you know, if it passes the WebInspect scan and the WebInspect doesn't have any red stuff, then we're good. Um, but what if you're running up to a WordPress site? You don't, conf you don't, maybe you want to run like WP scan, which is just a script that is going to find you a lot better data. So just understand the technology you're running against and making sure you're running the appropriate tool. Because there's a lot of times there's these CMS scanners out there that are a lot better to identifying these specific vulnerabilities. Um, but a few things to keep in mind, uh, you know, it can miss stuff, it can break stuff. I don't know if you've ever, you know, run a scan and getting some 503 service unavailable. Um, or it can take a long time. Have you ever pulled up a web inspect scan and it says it's going to take 53 days? I don't have that, that long time in the, uh, to wait for it. So sometimes automated testing just isn't going to be the solution for you and you have to fall back to your manual testing, which is uh, the next portion of the talk. 
we're actually going to run into a quick overview of manual testing and then dive into some examples that kind of illustrate what we're talking about. We have five examples. So, but for us, manual testing is about these four main things, um, kind of broken down on a high level. We kind of talked about them a little bit already, but the big thing is, you know, identify all the areas of user input. These are what we call injection points, and we want to fuzz them. You know, we like to use Burps Intruder for that. Uh, and you want to also identify any features um, and abuse them like an attacker. I'm a big advocate of like feature abuse when we talk about uh, pen testing and, and, and hacking. What I mean by that is I mean, we've got a login page. How can I abuse that feature? Well, maybe there's a password reset and I can get username enumeration. We have a file upload for uh, an avatar. Maybe I can upload a shell. It's essentially trying to figure out what does this technology let you do? And then what could an attacker do with that feature? And you can use your mind map to kind of map that out for you. Um, you also want to find the systems and content that others have missed because you can't test what you don't know about. Um, we get a lot of wins on our pen tests, not because they were like super cool low days, crazy stuff, but a lot of times just because, you know, oh, I didn't know that that directory had stuff from 1999, PHP code from 1999. Last pen test, I got code execution across the enterprise because the PHP code was living in some weird directory from 1999. I got really excited. Copyright 19, I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. You but, um, you know, so it, it doesn't have to be some crazy, you just have to find what's there. That was on the internet, you know, it just, you just have to look for it. Uh, and then continue to ask yourself, what happens if I try this? You have to be creative. I think like we go back to the whole thing, we're gonna fail a thousand times, you have to keep asking yourself and, uh, because it's very easy to say something's not vulnerable and go back to Facebook or YouTube. And as a tester, we need, we need to like isolate ourselves and get in the zone and do that John Wick, you know, mode uh, and keep asking yourself these questions. Um, here is another example of how you might identify how your input's being leveraged to fuzz appropriately. This does not cover all vulnerabilities, but it covers some, some pretty, pretty, pretty high ones, pretty common ones. So is your input landing on the screen, right? That, that's something I'm gonna look at that and say, if my input's on the screen, I'm gonna test for XSS, you know, script alert script, that didn't work, maybe a JavaScript event handler, that eh, didn't work, all right, then I'll throw it to burp and I'll use like a custom, Jadix has got some XSS fuzz lists, which are really nice, and I'll, I'll go through some custom fuzzing. Is it calling on store data? I'm doing like a search. Um, it's a little harder to, to know from a black box perspective, but you can text for test for SQL injection. There's a lot of ones here. We're gonna go through a couple of these. A file inclusion example, really cool. Um, but this is just essentially, start to think about how your input's being used so you can fuzz appropriately. You're not just like throwing random lists at stuff. You're trying to actually figure out, okay, how can I misuse it? Um, as I mentioned, burps are our go-to bread and butter tool for fuzzing. This is a screenshot of burp intruder. If you've never used it, you basically define injection points inside the request, and then you can later set up your word list for those injection points. Um, as I mentioned, fuzzdb, seclists have got some good options for you. Burp has some built-in ones as well. Um, but the big thing is just understanding, you know, how, how the input's being used so you can, you know, misuse appropriately. Uh, and if you're not using Burp Pro, Intruder's gonna run really slow and, and drive you nuts and you're probably not gonna wanna use it, but Burp Pro is inexpensive, so. All right, cool, and now, this is the moment where we're gonna get really into what we're gonna talk about. Andrew might like break a sweat, he might go crazy. Um, but we're gonna really go over five cool manual testing techniques of how you can go above and beyond automated testing. So this is when we're going into our Wreck-It Ralph mode. All right, so example one, feature abuse. All right, applications. A lot of times developers and just people in general, content management systems, they try to get crazy. They try to go, all right, well, you know, I, I really want to handle, I want to make some form-based contact us page and have my application send an email on behalf of these people and not just do a simple mail to, right? Well, that happens a lot. So contact us fields, feedback forms, look for all these different things, capture that post request it's making when you submit these different form fields in the UI, and sometimes you're gonna see some hidden parameters or different things that are client side being passed as well that you wouldn't see in the UI. And a lot of times people overlook that because they go, oh, you know, no one's ever gonna capture my stuff in a proxy, but eh, attackers will. So you need to look at that. And it sounds very simple, and it is. Essentially, we're gonna do SMTP injection. So how excited would I be if I told you I found a site where I can send an email on behalf of that site and I can control, it says I can control the to line, you know, in the UI, I can send it to anybody I want, but I can control the from line and I can send it from probably the CEO of that company. I'm pretty excited, right? Okay, so I find that there's a site admin and a subject parameter being passed in the post request client side, but it's not in the UI, it's trapped in our proxy and I can essentially send it from anyone I want and change the subject line to anybody I want on behalf of your web server. So thank you very much. You didn't do a simple mail too. You tried to go above and beyond. Example two, um, essentially here, this is where we're gonna combine our several findings, right? So we're gonna say, all right, our vulnerability scanner said we can get a username enumeration from the login. We, there's no automation controls, so there's no lockout in place for the login. 
and maybe the password complexity was low. We found that out from crawling the site and we saw that only eight characters and two numbers are you know, required for the complexity. When we piece all these three things together, they're all low findings, they're separate findings and maybe an automated vulnerability scanner, but when we piece them together and we do our manual testing, we can actually create the perfect storm of an account compromise, and this is where it gets fun. So ways to identify these things is, you know, password reset features, um, basically saying, you know, I, I want to reset this admin. I'm going to try admin as a username. And uh, in the password reset, it says, email address not found. Well, if I try Bob and it says email sent, I know Bob's a user now. Add him to my list. Login error messages. Rather than being generic, sometimes applications are very specific. And they shouldn't be. They should be more generic, whether you fail the p or pass the test. Contact us features. I've had it once where it said, which admin, and gave me a drop-down list of all the admins for the site, do you want to send this to? Thank you very much, contact us. Paige, you just told me all your admins, adding it to the list. Time for login attempts. So this is when you look at your, your burp, you know, your intruder, your things that you're running when you're doing these brute force attempts. Um, and you're going to see if there's a variance in time. Sometimes the status code won't change. But there's other ways to identify it. We can look at our intruder session and see if maybe when we get a valid login, it actually has a smaller variance of time than an invalid login for the response. User registration. That username already exists. A lot of applications have this. It's just no way around it unless you want to make generic error messaging. But you know, I, if, let's say, for example, I'm saying I want to be Zach on this site. Well, you can't be Zach. All right, well, I know Zach's a user now. I guess I got to be Zach1. So various error messages. Look at the HTML source code. Sometimes developers forget what they put in there in comments. Um, and just different things with Google hacking and OSINT. You can find a lot of username structure and things of that nature on these different forms, whether it's Pastebin, Stack Overflow, uh, YouTube. You can sometimes people will make YouTube videos of, hey, this is how you use my application. Log in, they show you that Bob's logged in, and okay, you know, it's just different things like that, you know, and they're just doing it for, for good nature, but, you know, attackers have no good nature. Um, sometimes the application just flat out tells you WordPress is guilty of this, PHPBB is guilty of this. It'll tell you who's the last person that made a comment or logged in. So, fun stuff, right? So, we got our username enumeration, we're building that list. We now find out that the login has no anti-automation controls in place. Basically, I don't want to deal with unlocking users. I don't want to deal with account lockouts or having some automated process. So yeah, people can just log in as many times as they want. Well, that's bad. That's a very bad practice. And if there's no sign of anti-automation controls, brute force is on the table. And it's going to happen until you're successful, um, or if you're that determined. Um, but no account lockout, if there's no caption in place, this is another way to thwart the, you know, the issue. Um, even like, I'm not a robot with Google, that's a simple thing where you just click a couple images and it goes, hey, is this a railroad, is this a railroad? Okay, you pass the test. Um, those kind of things can really help and having account, lock, account lockouts maybe after five bad tries really can help thwart the enemy. Um, but sometimes developers will say, all right, my main login is locked down, all right? But they forget about their API and they also forget about their mobile interfaces and they don't have the same controls in place. So always look at all these different login vectors. And finally, we're just bad. Everyone here is bad. I mean, it's not everyone. Most people are just bad at passwords, you know what I mean? And it's, it's sad. It, it, it's very true that, you know, you look every year they post the top 10, you know, passwords and they don't change very much. They're always just, you know, password or some variation of it, or maybe the year and the season and the company's name in the year, or keyboard walks, and people think they're getting tricky, but no, they're not. There's password lists out there with keyboard walks. Um, always keep in mind that there's tons of password lists out there like FuzzDB and Seclis have that are pre-built. You can use in your intruders brute force sessions. And you also want to just kind of maybe research um, different people that you're going after. Like maybe you do find out that Bob Seymour is a, is a valid user. Well, look in Bob's social media platform and start to figure out, is he a Washington Redskins fan? And then start building different, you know, variations of word lists of interest that maybe that's his password. Um, that's when you get really creepy, I guess, Redskins, too. One, two, three. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, and you can also use cool to tools like Cool, where they're going to crawl the site's content and try and pull, like, extract uh, keywords of interest and try and build word variation lists. There's tons of tools out there, but feel free to look at all those. And those are the three things that can really build that perfect storm and get you those account compromises that are just truly high impact, especially when you get someone with higher privileges. So example three, I was going against a map application. Uh, and I then unlinked content enumeration and I came across this proxy.ashx. 
So essentially what this, this resource is for is if you don't have a course policy in place with this map application, you can then make connections to other domains and have their content load and see if it, the connection works. So I basically appended a question mark at the end and then you know, I put Google as an example, just trying to reach out to another external internet facing site. And lo and behold, Google's HTML content is loaded while in, in, in sent to that proxy and then relayed back into the page while I'm still there and at that resource and it loads Google within the page and I'm still at the map site. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Um, maybe I have an open redirect in my hands. And from there you could do two different things. And the first thing, you know, simple phishing, you could basically put a malicious link, you could obfuscate the link and then try and make that in your campaign and distribute malware, or distribute whatever you're trying to do through this resource because you're trusting that map application but really you're putting bad boy set at the end of it. The other cool thing, so now I requested Google, right? Well, what if I start requesting internal IP space? What if I can bypass the firewall and make some TCP connections to systems internal? Well, we tried it and made an automated Python script to try this and lo and behold it worked. Very cool, right? This is out on the internet, some resource, and essentially if I just append some internal common web ports, I'm starting to basically map out your internal infrastructure and starting to get an idea of what is going on behind the scenes. And if I'm doing an external and internal pen test, I'm, you know, basically starting to map you out a little bit before we jump into the internal portion. But here you can see there, there's a Cisco email security appliance. I got the versioning information on the login page. And it's just kind of cool how you can convey that. And that's a real attack scenario that we came across. And it's just definitely interesting. So Andrew's going to jump into example four here because he did this. Yeah, so file inclusion to shell. This is always a good one. If you've never done it, I'm going to walk you through step by step on how you would massage file inclusion to shell, which if you are interested, this is the best way to pick up chicks at a bar. Um, it works. Trust me. Uh, so this is how I actually broke into an organization, highly secured organization. Uh, I was, you know, we spent a while on a lot of their main apps, a lot of their main infrastructure, and we're bashing our heads, failing that thousand times, right? And I finally stumbled upon a resource that got me code execution. I'm going to walk you through it. But a little backup on file inclusion for those who um, aren't familiar. Uh, file inclusion volumes can lead to code execution, or they maybe, they maybe they can't. An example of a code execution would be like a PHP include. It really depends upon the function that's being called. An example of a file inclusion that's just going to like cat files the screen is a PHP echo. Um, do you also have local file inclusion and remote file inclusion? So local file inclusion is exactly that. You're including local files. And with that particular type of vulnerability, it takes a little more work and magic to get your code execution because you'll have to get your input into like a log file or somewhere else on disk and then include that file and that inputs code. Log poisoning is a common term for that. Remote file inclusions are a whole lot easier because you can just point it back to you, say grab my code, run it, and it runs it, and it's awesome. Um, so we're going to go through an example of uh, this here. Now this is an example I like because, for this talk especially, because it, uh, a vulnerability scanner is not going to find this. Um, even big guns, vulnerability scanner, web, web inspect, Acunetics, um, you name it. The reason being is that debug.php was living out in the web server, wasn't linked. So first off, unlinked content, we talked about that. If you don't actually map your app and find these cool little interesting resources, you're not going to be able to fuzz. Now the second reason is, I go to debug.php and I think I actually did this and then I went to lunch. It was a blank screen. You know, I was like, man, blank screen, nothing here, what's going on? I came back, I was like, all right, you know, what are we going to do next? I'm going to want to try to figure out my inputs. Now, commonly, you know, you're going to find inputs by a parameter, whether it be a get parameter, post parameter. I just started with get, and that's where we put a dollar sign uh, or question mark equals parameter name. And I started to fuzz with Burps Intruder, right? So I set up the sniper and I said, okay, let me go through common parameter names, which you can't see there probably in the URL bar is question mark page equals test gave back a different response. So I started to thumb through and you can sort by length and Burps Intruder results. I got 193 on everything else. Page equals test gave me 633. I'm like, cool, let me go check it out. So I go over, I'm getting a PHP warning. And I'm getting very excited right now because it says function.include. And if you remember what we talked about in the slide before, include means code execution. So we're getting, we're, it's awesome. And we see test is there. Now, um, if you fed this parameter to a vulnerability scanner and it knew about the parameter, um, it might land you with, with, with the vulnerability, but you'd have to really get it to that point. And the vulnerability scanner is not just going like, to get you there all the way. So there's a lot of manual features, that manual testing you have to get to this point. But from here, I can get code execution. And the way being is, um, 
this is an RFI. You could test for local file inclusion, uh, you know, direct traversal up, Etsy password, cool. Um, and the next thing is to test for remote file inclusion. So I just pointed it back to myself, my attacker box, set up um, a little Python simple HTTP server. If you're a pen tester, this is a great way to get a quick web server up. So um, uh, the first one there, number one, is the request I'm making to the server. Number two, is it fetching my code from me? And number three, is it running and telling me the result? The, co the code I was just running was a quick system ID command, uh, and I'm getting code execution which is really awesome. Um, in real life, this was actually running a system on a Windows box, so it's like Mimikatz and Spray everywhere at that point. It's awesome, because that was on a web server for like a really long time, uh, and it had gone through many pen tests, many security assessments, many bone scans, and never been found, but these are the kind of things that your manual testing and your, your kind of hunting mentality, and you're not giving up, can find you these gems um, that just you know aren't that hard necessarily when we look at it on the slides there, but it just doesn't get pieced together without the human interaction. The next and last example is email spoofing. I bring this up because I'm not, uh, I find this a lot actually, believe it or not, and Vuln scanners don't do a lot of this testing very well because you need to have an email server uh, set up to interpret it. So you need to be able to basically see if I'm sending in some input, can I get an email back? And how many Vuln scanners here set up their own email to see if they're receiving an email in the inbox? Not a whole lot, I don't know of any. Uh, could be some out there, but the first step to do email spoofing, this is a quick slide. Uh, step one, I'll find the mail servers. I'll run a host command, get the mail servers, I'm, I'm, I'm actually hacking myself here with the Primal Security blog. blog. I think it, I think it actually is still vulnerable. Um, you can tell net to the mail services Google, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, here. I'm setting up the, the the SMTP commands: mail mail from recipient to. This is what your mail servers are going to actually parse, uh, and, and not what the Outlook client's necessarily going to show you unless you view the headers. But that's what that's what your mail servers are going to parse. So here I'm just putting in ridiculously fake data uh, at PrimalSecurity.net. And then I'm do, I type data, and I'm going to actually put the, the email together, which is what's going to get parsed by Outlook client. And I'm putting in additional headers, that the from header, the to header, the stuff your users are going to see, the subject line, demo for con talk, take a look, I spoof the email. This is how I, I, I find this a lot. And what I'll do is I'll play around with Sometimes I can't spoof the uh, step three headers, but I can spoof the step four headers, and the user still clicks stuff. So it's cool. Um, and the slides are online already, so the, the, the steps there you don't have to memorize. Um, here's what it would look like in my inbox. Uh, demo for con talk. You know, you can see it, it came right through. This is Google Apps for work. Works just fine. To a user, this is actually sent by G Gmail. So in my actual testing, I found, um, okay, I, I can't spoof the, the SMTP actual headers that uh, I sent in uh, for the mail server, but I could control the stuff that the Outlook client's going to parse, and I wanted to model legitimate communications and make sure that everybody has to change their password and click my link. Um, <laughs> highly successful phishing. Uh, uh, I'm sure it goes without saying there uh, from the help desk, but you can see it just says help desk support, looks legitimate, uh, really cool stuff. The scary thing here is this actually works. Um, if you are using Google Apps for work right now, uh, and you have not set up DNS text records for SPF, DCAM, DMARC, you are vulnerable. Um, I can actually use your organization and spoof to a lot of other places right now through you because it doesn't have to be your domain. I could do like at whitehouse.gov and Google will send it to you. And people trust Google's mail servers when it comes to their infrastructure, their, their stuff. So I can misuse Google Apps for work and uh, in a dirty way. So my finding is that Google doesn't really tell you to do this. You go to Google Apps for work, you get your $5 email per month. It's awesome. Um, really good service, but you have to set these DNX test rec text records um, to prevent spoofing attacks, and they don't like tell you right out of the box. Though, though if you call them, they'll walk you through it. It's pretty easy. But uh, it's when I come across a organization that's using Google Apps for work, nine times out of ten, they are vulnerable to spoofing attacks, uh, not to, to themselves, but also as a proxy to others. Um, and now the final stage reporting. Like Zach said, this is our favorite part. Who cares about shells and spoofing emails and stuff? Woo! And we can. We can get in Word and get in PowerPoint. I mean, this is that's why I went. That's why I got in this industry, right? Um, we uh, we like to leverage Markdown. Uh, if you've never used Markdown, it's like HTML shorthand. If you went to get if you went to GitHub, you can it looks really clean like that. Mubix has a uh, common findings database project on GitHub, which is basically Markdown uh, templates for vulnerabilities. So you can like grab them to build your reports out really nice. Make sure you talk to your customers. You can spend a lot of time making a pretty markdown report, which is an HTML that looks okay in PDF. And they come back and they say they want a Word doc. And you're like, oh, well, shoot, I, I did made it in markdown. Yeah, just work, yeah. <laughs> so make sure you talk to them about the formatting, what they expect and what they need. They may, just, they may need a spreadsheet. They may need Word doc, PDF, what have you. So just make sure you land that before you start using markdown. Um, reporting, another piece that we talked about, and we talked about like the pen test means different things to different people. Um, we get this a lot where it's like, it's a pen test, but don't hack anything. Oh, okay, I gotcha. All right, I'll do that. Um, so if you can exploit it, cool, write it up. Um, if you can't exploit it, 
What could you have done? Re include an attacker narrative. We like to do that. So if we cannot exploit it and they say, no, 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 not rules of engagement, I'll say, OK, to land the impact with the customer, I will replicate the environment in a lab, take some screenshots, and show what I could have done. Um, and a lot, oftentimes than not, they may come back and say, all right, you really can't do that. And I'll say, OK, well, why don't you let me try? Um, and that, that can be helpful to land the impact and get things fixed. Ultimately, that's why we're here. Uh, also, highlight business impact. I've had, like Zach said, I've had customers that will, if you know what to make, what, what keeps them up at night and what gets them uh, afraid, um, you can really find the right vulnerabilities for them. Like, like Zach said, if availability is key, you know, and you find vulnerabilities that's going to take their, their point of sale systems down, that can be some, that might be critical to them or, or, or if it's coming up a medium on the vuln scanner. You know, so keep that in mind. Um, and also uh, include a detailed write-up on what you did. I think that's getting more and more important as you talk more about red teams than you are about pen tests and other types of security assessments. But it's important to talk about what you did as a tester because that can be leveraged from a, um, you know, for the, for the vendors. They can go back and say, okay, what did I see? What didn't I see? What tools did you run? When did you, wh wh what time were they run at? And I can go back and look at my you know, sim, my event logs, and, and you can work with them after the fact to say, okay, I, you know, as you can see, I ran this on Wednesday, and uh, I, we, we popped that, we popped that uh, LFI you know, uh, on Wednesday night, and you, you can go back and help them and see. So you got to keep, that, that involves keeping detailed notes as you test, which is not fun, but uh, it can be very helpful. Uh, and then it finally include that high level summary, you know, to, to land home, those, those metrics, find out whatever metrics they need. You know, if, I, what I like to do is find out uh, what, it, you know, take the industry they're in and compare them to other like industries. So like if it's a school, compare them to other schools kind of thing, see where they land up in their market. Offer remediation testing. This is very important because you know, especially when we talk about web app vulns, uh, it can be complex to fix. It's not often just a, yeah, sorry. Just a quick question. Do you, do you ever place the uh, links of certain content that are vulnerable in the reports so they can actually go to it from the report itself? We don't uh, usually put the links directly in there. We'll break the link, though. So they, they, can, they can go there themselves. Yeah, but it's not like hyperlinked in the report or anything. But they, we break the link with, like, brackets. We take that, we take that DOD mindset. We always break links, you know. <laughs> but... We will include the, the. I'll give them code too. I'll, I'll write. I'll write a little Python script if, if it's applicable. Um, I give them code to retest, but um, it, it kind of bounces in the remediation testing. Um, we definitely provide you know as much detail as I can to the to the customer on what vulnerability we found and how to how to exploit it, how it could be exploited, kind of thing. Um, and then offer remediation testing. So if they fix it, you know that script alert script's blacklisted. But a JavaScript event handler isn't, you know, just reevaluate the findings. So you're making sure they're not fixing an instance of the problem. They're actually fixing the entire problem. Um, so you oftentimes have to go back on all your key findings and retest them um, like you would have from, from scratch. And it can lead to additional testing, obviously, and that stronger relationship with the customer. Um, I've actually had a situation where they fixed a file upload example. I popped a shell through file upload. It was a trivial meme type bypass. Just change meme type in the post request. And it was file upload.php or whatever it was. I forget the, the language. And then they fixed it with a file upload one.php. And I just went back and just touched the old file upload. They didn't take it off. So little things like that. You got to be creative and like think, think like, like they said, why would anybody go back to the old file? They don't know what's there. I'm like, I, yeah, yeah, but you can look. It's not that bad. Um, here's some useful links. Like Zach said, we started out this with we love learning. We, in our, our day jobs, we like to learn. Our night jobs, we do primal security. So we're, it's all about learning and sharing knowledge. Um, there's a lot of uh, links here to do that. Free training on Cyberary, which is really great. Uh, CTFs, Volnhub, Pat, there's a bunch of good links here. Not going to go into all of them. Um, Offsec training and SANS training, really like. A lot of good books and talks there, including one by Michael Hoffman, who's speaking next. Um, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, so feel free to check them out. These links are on, on our website. Uh, and that's it. Um, we we uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to speak here. We, we are hiring right now. We're interested in talking to anybody out there that's doing security testing and that kind of stuff. Uh, feel free to reach, out to reach out to us after the talk uh, or reach out to us here, email, Twitter, uh, website. And Thanks. Shot in, the, shot in the dark, if anyone's going to be somehow in, in B-Sides Jackson in Mississippi in two weeks, we'll be there too with a yeah. different talk. Complete shot in the dark, though. I realize yeah. that. Jackson, Mississippi. Anybody heading down? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. But we'll be giving an internal pen testing talk there. So thank you all very much. And let us know if you have any questions afterwards.